All right, and we are live, Jim. Well, Jim, thank you so much for coming this evening. I uh, hope you come back often. Hope you tell your friends to join us. Uh, we'll all benefit if they do. Uh, the more, the merrier. I've got a couple of announcements. Uh, number one, and Dylan, if you can put up my email on the chat thing or whatever that program is you've got. Uh, any any ideas or suggestions you have for our Zoom meetups, let me know. Uh, and anything at all you'd like to see or talk about or think we ought to include, uh, really would appreciate your, uh, your feedback. Uh, the other comment that I have, I, I found an organization the other day. Come on, baby. You remember, you remember when Dan was on, he talked about, uh, he got this designation of, of master model builder. And I went on the internet trying to find it. Well, I found an association called the Professional Association of Model Makers. And this association has, has uh, model makers from all different companies, uh, like Lionel that Dan worked for and so forth. And it's, uh, it's an interesting association, I think. So I've, uh, I've asked uh, one of the people, one of the companies, uh, the president of this association owns a company and I asked her to, uh, to join us and uh, to talk about not just the association, but her company. And her company is involved in the technology of 3D printing and duplicating uh, molds and, and all that kind of thing. And she has a studio, so she can take a, an idea from the idea stage and you know, produce it you know, as much as a company wants her to, uh, to play the role, either to outsource uh, the total uh, uh, model making or, or whatever. And I think that ought to really be interesting for us because while we've heard 3D people, you know, with, that have 3D equipment in their home and that kind of thing, uh, and we've heard different people talk about their use of it, like Dylan uses it in his company all the time, but this is from a, a professional standpoint and may give us a different insight into all the do's and don'ts and can and can'ts involved with that uh, technology and where the technology is going. So uh, I, I hate to say it, but we're book solid until almost the middle of October now, uh, two nights a week, if you can believe that. Uh, so when we, when she said that she would be happy to do it and wanted to do it, uh, she was talking about doing it in weeks and I was talking about doing it in months. So uh, I hope that, that we'll be able to schedule her uh, and I hope that we may be able to get other companies in that association to join us because I think looking at our modeling from, from a professional standpoint, not from a, a hobbyist standpoint, uh, may be a real benefit and we may learn a lot from, uh, from that association. Uh, so with that said, our featured modeler tonight is uh, Chuck Tripper, who will uh, discuss his modeling and his building techniques. And I think you're really going to enjoy Truck, Chuck, because not only is he a model railroad, uh, but he he models uh, uh, radio control equipment, like tanks, like boats, uh, and he builds models. Uh, and I, I think you're really going to enjoy uh, hearing from him. So with that said, Chuck, I'll turn it over to you, sir. Well, thank you, Jim. Um, uh, I started in model railroading about 1990 in uh, N-scale and built a small point-to-point -point layout in my shop, which is about 16 feet long. Just built a, like I say, a point-to-point -point in N-scale. I always liked the steam locomotives versus the diesel, but back in the 90s, there weren't a whole lot of uh, steam end scale. So the Cato brand made an exceptionally well running end scale diesel. So I, I played with that for a while. Um, then after uh, end scale, I kind of decided I wanted to get into the, uh, the lumber styled uh, railroads like logging companies, backwood logging companies. And um, I started getting into collecting the Japanese brass. Uh, logging locomotives, the Heislers, the Climaxes, the Porters, and those obscure running, I mean, those obscure locomotives, but it, the Japanese built them exceptionally well, and they started in the late 90s to really go up in price, so I collected quite a few of those, 
and um, kept them in the brass color. I didn't paint them and uh, just ran them back and forth. Uh, after getting kind of tired of that, I sold that collection and used that to finance a G scale outdoor railroad. So um, I, I decided that I was gonna turn my front yard. I live in, in Carmel Valley, California. Um, it's pretty temperate here. Average temperature is about 70 degrees. Today it's like 92, um, but it's really pleasant out here. So you could do a lot of outdoor railroading. Um, I hired a, uh, a friend, which became a friend of mine, uh, one of the feature article writers for Garden Railway Magazine, still published today. And um, he was a, uh, a, a gentleman from San Mateo, which is near San Francisco, and he builds garden railroads all over the country, uh, I, I would imagine now all over the world because he's become pretty famous. So um, I invited him down from San Mateo to my house, which is about 100 miles from where he lives. And he spent the week with me and we tore up my front yard and we built a G-scale garden railroad. So that took about a week and we had waterfalls and trestles and tunnels, um, turnouts. And um, I bought Bachman, um, locomotives. I had a Bachman Shea, a Bachman um, Porter. Then I bought uh, an AccuCraft um, Heisler, which was beautiful. They're all brass made of China, but the detail is incredible. And um, built a lot of, uh, or in fact, built all the um, outdoor structures. I called it the Carmel Valley Mining and Lumber Company. And I built a sawmill and trestles, and I built a yarder which is a, um, a donkey on a sled that they use to offload the, the, the logs on the flat cars once they got to the mill. Then I built a, um, uh, and this is all in 120.3 or 122 scale. Um, I built a, a steam driven pile driver and I took that to the, um, to the uh, West Side Lumber Company reunion that they have every year in, in Sonora, California, which is up in the gold mining country. And they have a modelers convention there every year. And I took that up there and I think I won uh, second or third prize for um, non-locomotive logging equipment. Anyway, they put an article in, in uh, Garden Railway magazine, or it was Fine Scale magazine, one of the two, and um, I really enjoy building and weathering and detailing and uh, don't do a whole lot of running. Uh, in, in about 2001, my knees started to pain when I got down on the ground to reset the cars and clean the track, et cetera. So it got harder and harder for me to get on my knees and spend any time down there, which made garden railroading um, a bit of a pain. So I uh, slowly liquidated all of my garden railroad um, equipment and started uh, getting into um, RC, remote control. And um, I did that a little bit in the 80s when Tamaya first came out with their sand scorcher and some of their cars. But um, in, in 2005, they really got into it. So I bought a couple of RC cars and put them together and then I got into some RC tanks, Tamaya, which is a terrific model company you guys probably know. Um, their directions are stunning, the, probably the best in the, in the country or the world. And their kits are pretty much the gold standard in uh, remote control and even plastic fine scale modeling. Anyway, they had a couple of uh, tanks. They had a, a Tiger tank, um, that was very popular and it was a kit. So I, I bought that and put it together and then a Sherman tank um, and then a, a Panzer. Um, and then they came out with a Leopard, a German Leopard tank. So um, I, I you know, put those together, painted them, camouflaged them. Uh, I can't not leave it alone. So I have to you know, find 
what I can detail it with. So, you know, you buy the bed rolls and the packs and the canvas and the tarps and the netting and the, the, the shells for the machine guns and uh, armor for the cannon and stuff like that. So uh, a lot of research uh, is done on the internet, thank God, because uh, those products are pretty much everywhere now. And um, I would say that uh, today, as of today, I'm, I'm pretty much out of railroading into RC uh, building. And I, I have a couple of friends that aren't far from me that have a rather large property and have built an RC uh, track. So we run our RC uh, truggies and buggies and one ten scale short course trucks and, and model those. But those are bashers and you can't put much detail on those. So you know, you run them hard, you break them, you go home, you fix them, and the next Sunday you're back out there running them again. So as far as scale goes, um, I build boats, RC boats, and um, I'll show you in a few minutes some of the uh, boats that I built. I started building those in 83 when I lived in San Francisco. I lived about two blocks from Golden Gate Park, and Golden Gate Park has one of the first ponds that were built for uh, model boating. It was built in 1893 for the World's Fair and naturally back then they only had sailboats but they built this beautiful pond that you could walk right up to. It's all uh, surrounded by benches and park trees and it's just a beautiful setting and the San Francisco Modelers Yacht Club was started in uh, 1893 which I became a member of and um, they had modelers there that were just incredibly gifted uh, people. I left San Francisco in the uh, mid 80s, but I had met some uh, older gentlemen that were machinists on victory ships from World War II that befriended me when I was in my 20s and, and um, took me to uh, San Francisco State University or San Francisco State uh, machine shop. And on Saturdays and Sundays when it was closed, the, um, the, the teacher was also in the model boating. And he befriended me and took me to the shop and we, he would kind of teach me uh, some rudimentary uh, milling and lathe skills for motor mounts and custom exhaust pipes for the backs of my boats and et cetera. So um, I really gained a lot from uh, all the friendships that I made uh, in boat building. And today that's what I still do a lot of is is building boats and I love the detail work on it. I love manufacturing the obscure, hard to find, non-existent parts um, for building boats. And I, I tend to build in the, uh, you know, 28 to 54 inch scale, which is, you know, depending on what you're building. Um, so I like them rather hefty. The, the, you know, the end scale stuff's a little hard on my eyes and fingers. So the bigger stuff um, just works better for me. Um, I think how I met Jim was uh, showing a little uh, two-minute video of a ON30 uh, scale layout that I built on with some styrofoam. Um, I'll show it to you guys if you haven't already seen it. Um, it's right here, and um, you might be able to see it. It's a uh, uh, two. It's kind of what I call a a pancake uh, layout. It's got two continuously running ON30 tracks with a couple of small porters on them and um, all made out of styrofoam so it's incredibly light and um, some of the uh, detail on it down here is you might see the uh, the camp for the hobos and uh, down here I've got um, a swimming hole for the kids and then um, over here, I've got uh, father and son fishing uh, at the bank. And up on top, I've got a hunter uh, taking aim on a mountain lion. So that's kind of, you know, here's some of the, the, uh, the locomotives, just a Bachman Porter and uh, a work car and a little scratch built uh, caboose. That were um, that was made to take these narrow and sharp corners. 
So that's kind of it. Um, happy to answer any questions I can for you guys. So I'll leave it to you. What is an RC track? You say that uh, you went to your friends and he has a radio controlled track that he's created. What is that? Well, uh, um, a lot of these RC uh, popular cars now are scale models of the short course um, trucks that you see in the stadium. So they'll get a, a football stadium, an in indoor football stadium, and they'll bring in, you know, a hundred yards of dirt and they'll make these jumps and they'll make a track and they'll have these um, uh, uh, Traxxas and, and Ford and a lot of companies have these 800 horsepower tubular uh, uh, chassis with, with powerful motors in them uh, and they put these fiberglass truck bodies on them and they race them around and do jumps like in motocross and those are call, called short course trucks. And my friend in Carmel Valley uh, has about two acres and he's got a skip loader and he, he uh, had this big area in the backyard that he wasn't doing anything with. So he, he, he built a, uh, a, tr a, a track with jumps and, and banked curves. So uh, a half a dozen of us get our, our scale model uh, RC trucks out there uh, and run them on the track. Can you show us one? Do you have one of your models there? Um, well, I, I don't have one in front of me. I could go get one. It might take me a minute to go downstairs and pull it out of the garage. By, by the way, that's the interesting thing where Traxxas, there are Traxxas trucks in the real races because Traxxas makes basically RC cars. Exactly. And that's, and that's, that's their advertisement, Traxxas. right? So, yeah. is this real <laughs> so go back to the prototypical. We've had discussion at the time about prototypical, model, model typical. So you actually have vehicles in the real world that are named Traxxas and are modeled after the models they sell in the, R in the model world. And then you have models of Ford trucks where they make them look like Ford trucks in the real world and models. So it's this weird thing that you have this cross pollination both ways. It's a, it's a really weird little hobby thing between the two where the models are actually represented in the real world to sell. You know, used to say race on Sunday and sell on, they're racing on Sunday to sell models on Monday. <laughs> Traxxas, Traxxas is a model company, and they, to, to yeah. promote their models, they built the full-size trucks, whereas Ford builds the full-size trucks and then licenses to model companies model company. the rights to make the bodies to put on the RC cars that look like the Ford trucks. But with Traxxas, it's the other way around, and, <laughs> and they do a tremendous business. I mean, Traxxas has boats has oh, yeah. a buggies, has trucks, has cars, has, you know, they're huge. Yeah. We need to have, so we need to have a similar thing for people to promote model railroading in their hobbies so that, you know, there's a place where Atherin could build full size engines to remote. I, I don't, it's just an interesting observation. So we kind of worth having fun and observations in these initial modeling. I would love to hear something specifically, which is, so we have a shop out here called Ages of Sale. It's actually in Hayward. You probably know about it. Um, and basically, they carry lots of, of boat parts and boat stuff. And one of the things I was looking for, I was looking for some um, basically blocks for block and tackle. So I wanted some two sheave and one sheave and two sheave blocks for a fishing boat I was building for a module. It's a moss landing module. Something we can talk about, kind of probably interesting from your perspective. But um, I was amazed at what they had and we were having a conversation and someone was saying that one of the things was there were a lot of tools in the boat hobby that were different than the tools. And so I was just curious, having done both and having been around both, I mean, are there, what are the things that we as model railroaders should really be paying attention to in the model boat hobby? I mean, are there things over there that they're using that you could see, you know, things we struggle with, we don't know how to do it. They've, you know, for example, how you do wrap, you know, the, the, the rigging, they've got, they've got jigs to put that together. I, I just wondering if you've seen things you say, these are yes. parts to go look at. Well, I think one of your best sources is a company called Micromark. Yep. And Micromark, uh, probably uh, some of you guys already know, but if you don't, uh, Micromark is a terrific company 
back east that sells uh, tools for modelers and paints and kits and just about anything you can think of. And when you get their catalog, you'll see stuff you never even thought of before. And I found them to be a tremendous asset in, uh, uh, in building models because I don't like to stay on one particular genre for too long. I get bored, so I want to try something new. And when I built my boats or when I build my layouts or whatever, I try not to keep duplicating the same thing. I know I'd get better if I kept doing it, but I yeah. like trying different things to kind of tax me and, and it keeps my brain trying to figure out the problems. Yeah. But when you talk about the tools, um, I, the boats that I build are, are mostly, um, say 1940 and forward. I don't do sailboats, so uh, I couldn't tell you too much about the actual rope rigging, but a lot of the other tools that I use, you know, somebody asked me the other day, what is the, um, what's the single most important tool that I use for railroading, for boat building, for RC cars, for anything? And I thought about it, and whenever I finish a project and put all my tools back, there are two tools that I always leave out on my workbench because I know I'm going to use them for anything I do. And one, the first one is a really good pair of tweezers. And I'm talking, when I say good pair, I'm talking about a pair of tweezers that is easy on the fingers to manipulate back and forth. One that doesn't have a lot of tension where you get a lot of pushback and it's, it's strenuous on your fingers. So to me, uh, especially when I was doing N scale and HO scale and ON30 scale, you're using tweezers all the time. So uh, a good pair of tweezers was always uh, right there on my workbench. And uh, just a file, um, you know, you can buy a six pack of files, but just a, a flat file I use for just, I mean, for every model all the time, not to mention exacto knives. And, and different blades, but a, a typical X-Acto knife with a number 11 blade will accomplish 90% of what I do and maybe what you guys do. Um, a, drill, a, a rotary tool is invaluable, and I've had mine for 25 years. I've got two or three of them, uh, one plug-in, one battery-powered, but um, the different bits on, on Dremel tools are uh, invaluable. And, and Zona saws, Exacto saws, you know, they're, because I'm always cutting either plastic or balsa, um, you know, so those are really helpful. Cool. Thanks. Do you have some of your boats that we could see? Sure. Um, let's see here. This first one here, can, can you guys see that? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's a, uh, that's a Vietnam uh, era, what they call a PIBR, uh, PBR. It's a patrol boat riverine. That's what the R stands for. And these were, um, this is a, um, uh, an RC uh, jet powered boat. Can you see the, the jet drives in the back here? Mm. Yes. And that's, uh, that's got also reverse where the buckets go down. And then, um, this one right here is one that I recently built. That's all scratch built. And that's a, um, can you get a good view of that? Mm -hmm. That's a, uh, um, that's called an SOCR, Special Operations Craft Riverine. Um, and that had, as you can see on the bow, um, a uh, uh, minigun shooting about 33,000 rounds a minute. And then it's got a uh, grenade launcher midships. And are you able to, am I getting at view? Yes. And then, and then on the back, it's got a, uh, a 50 caliber. Um, and these boats were used in rivers. As you can see too on the bottom, that's all jet drive. I like building models with uh, jet-powered propulsion systems running on, on uh, LiPo batteries. Then um, I, I finished this one recently. Um, 
let's see if I can get a picture. This is a uh, um, this is an open bow, an open console fishing boat, and I built that because I liked. Um, can you see those outboard motors on the back? Yes. Yeah. I liked uh, I like outboard motors, so um, I built that. Just I, I wanted a boat that I could put two outboard motors on, and then I built this. See here, I built this yacht in uh, 1983, and this one was uh, built with. Uh, uh, a laminated deck where I had to, um, let's see here, where I had to uh, lay the balsa with each strip and mahogany, and then I had to uh, uh, chrome the, the pieces and, and source those, um, finding some of the, the uh, furniture for the back was fun, thanks to the internet. Mm -hmm and the uh, tow boat was a Midwestern kit. And then uh, my piece de resistance is this uh, tugboat down here that I built. That took me about a year and a half. And that had some incredible detail on it. Um, everything is scratch built. What material is it built out of? Uh, fiberglass hull and fiberglass superstructure. And um, pretty much everything else you can think of, bits of uh, plastic and wood, uh, tubing, um, shoelaces I use for the fire hose, uh, uh, Yoplait yogurt uh, for the radar dome. Hmm. Um, you know, just, you really learn to repurpose things as you scratch build because, it, you know, I'm not a 3D modeler. I wish I was. Then I could 3D print everything. But since I didn't have a 3D printer and don't know how to use one, um, it's just uh, bits and pieces of, you know, you walk through a hardware store. And to me, that was like uh, going into Fort Knox because <laughs> I would find things that, uh, uh, I would repurpose for this or for that. Chuck, what uh, scale would those be roughly? Well, um, the uh, the military boats would probably be one tenth or one uh, one tenth scale or one eighth scale. The uh, tugboat is about one twenty fourth because I was using G scale. Um, uh, track workers for my uh, tugboat crew, and they were from Pola, I think, um, or Prizer, um, and I think they were 124 scale or 120th. So it's surprising how many things I used uh, in railroading when I was building my um, outdoor G scale layout outside. There was a company called Ozark Miniatures. And I don't know if they're still in business now, but they were a, a terrific company that had uh, all kinds of pieces for uh, logging railroads. You know, if, if, for you to set up the, uh, uh, the logging cars, the, 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 the logging shed, the, the sawmill. They had all the little, uh, you know, scale bits and pieces, the hardware, the, the nuts, the bolts, the hinges, the outhouse, the just everything you can possibly think of and I over the years I bought quite a few of those pieces and kept them in little plastic containers and when I got out of railroading I kept all that stuff and it's surprising how much I've used on my boats so um, you never throw anything away in in the hobby you know I mean I've got a, a box of uh, sheet tubing and, and metal you know I just put all metal pieces in I got another sheet box for pieces of plastic. I got another sheet for, uh, you know, clear plastic acetate, you know, for windows or whatever. Um, Cause you never know when you're going to need something you go, gee whiz, oh, I got, I know I got that somewhere. And you go through <laughs> your box and sure enough, saves you a few bucks. 
What about the figures that you have on the boats and everything? Do you buy those or are they available or you have to make them or what? Well, that's a really good question. Um, the, I'll show you here. On this, on this boat here, you can see the figures. Some of these up close. Let's see if I can get you a close up. They are so lifelike. And those figures um, came from eBay, and they're, they're called McFarlane. McFarlane is the artist or the designer of these figures, and he makes uh, not only those figures, but he makes like Spider-Man and Batman, and he makes a lot of fantasy figures. But his figures are so realistic that when I decided I was gonna build this boat, I built it because I knew I could buy these figures and they were so lifelike that I said, I'll build a boat around these figures. And like one figure came from a, uh, uh, um, a Huey helicopter that had a minigun out the side. And the, um, I'll show you the, the guy for that, as you can see there, um, was the minigun operator on the helicopter. So, um, McFarland made a bunch of different figures, and today you can't buy the figures anymore. They're they're all collectible. They they, they stopped being made probably in the early 2000s. So you know some of those figures were 100 bucks a piece just for the figure. Uh, especially um, the machine gunner guy because you got the Gatling gun, the mini gun with it, and I needed two of those. So. Um, it's incredible, but uh, those were the most expensive uh, pieces on the boat were the figures. Now, the other figures on the other boats are generally, um, you know, either wrestlers or action figures that I go on eBay and I'll buy them. And if they have um, uh, manipul malleable or uh, articulated, I should say, arms, then you can, um, you can paint them and dress them up I use a little putty at the joints once you have the joints set for where you want to place them. Uh, you can change the clothes, paint them up, and make them fit. But that first one I showed you on the uh, Riverine boat, those are just an incredible detail. So I, I wasn't going to touch those. I bought those just and built the boat around it. Mm -hmm. What is but your yeah, power? I, I, what was your power source for the Riverine boat? That's it's a jet, that, that's a double jet drive too. I know, but what does that mean? Oh, well, uh, are you hey, familiar Chuck, with it? if term? I can interject real quick, uh, your video just got yeah. out. Oh, okay, let's, let's see here. Uh, are you familiar asking, with the term jet drive? I think, I think what he's asking, Chuck, is is it, is it electrical power or is it oh, like yeah. motor, Every, battery? Everything is electric. Okay. Everything is electric running on um, either NICAD or LiPo batteries. It just a quick, quick question. So I, when I went into that age of sale, I happened to notice this really cool steam tugboat. And it was, you know, about four, four feet long, and it was, but it was a kit. And then I happened to click on it, and it said, well, for the power source, they had both a steam power generator and a steam engine, which, by the way, together, I think we're about 1200 or 1500 bucks between the two. But just that, have you have you ever looked at that kind of thing where you're doing a steam? Yeah, I have. I, I, actually, I was thinking of building the African Queen after the Humphrey mm -hmm. Bogart yep, movie, yep. and that's a real popular boat. And a lot of a lot of guys when I was in the club in San Francisco had that. The old timers, um, you know, there were a lot of steam boats back in the uh, in the eighties when I was living in the city, uh, and a lot of the guys had that. So yes, you can build a static steam, you know, like a plastic boiler and, and the single cylinder um, for static and put electric motor, you know, under the floorboards and run it that way. But most guys that buy the African Queen, they buy the, the actual steam boiler and motor by a company called Saito, S-A-I-T-O, out of Japan. And they build, they build the boilers that you can get a two cylinder, uh, 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 three cylinder, four cylinder, you can get vertical, horizontal cylinders with actual, you know, steam boilers, beautiful 
uh, beautiful workmanship, uh, you know, wood lined and uh, magnificent. And they, they, they truly uh, become beautiful, almost heirloom models run off of, um, I think, um, rubbing alcohol they use for yeah. a fuel, uh, uh, those pellets that you used to buy for, um, you know, the steam, steam models I had when I was, I think, I don't know, 10 or 12 years old in the early 60s. And you put like a, like a little white cube in the boiler, and light it on fire, and it would heat up the water, and then it would spin the wheel. It's the same principle. Cool. Do you remember a guy named Dick Stark up in San Francisco? He was a member Dick up there. Dick Stark. No, I don't. Okay, yeah. He's a model railroader here, and I'm in Pleasanton. So in this area, he was a member up there. So. Oh, cool, you're from thanks. Pleasanton? Yeah, yeah, I'm in the Pleasanton area. Uh -huh. so, so we're meeting we're meeting in a video meetup in florida but we actually all live on the other side of the country did you know <laughs> did you know a guy by the name of jack verducci I, I the name sounds familiar but i think it's probably an association with other names yeah jack jack was the um was the guy that built my outdoor railroad and he's a a, a contributor for the a garden railway magazine yep. that's still produced and and he's like the top one of the top names in garden railroading yep and uh another guy that was really popular was a uh, um somebody I, I met when i was in my 30s i'm 69 now um his name was jack or dick dick truesdale and and dick was a uh was a fighter pilot in World War II, and after the war was over, he flew for Pan Am. <clears throat> and as he was flying back and forth from Japan to the United States, he would uh, bring back these uh, locomotives uh, in HO scale. And, uh, you know, he'd put them in his briefcase two or three at a time. When I met him, he was in his late 70s and went to his house in Capitola, which is near Santa Cruz on the coast here. And he had one of the most beautiful uh, brass HO uh, locomotive collections, I would have to say, in the world. I mean, he probably had a wall that was at least 12 feet long by 8 feet high, uh, floor to ceiling, shelves, all lined with brass locomotives. Okay. I mean, he, he could have put his son through Harvard with the value <laughs> of that collection. And a modeler, par, I mean, just one of the best modelers I ever met. I mean, and even in his late 70s, he could detail a model and put together an HO uh, boxcar, you know, with the fine motor skills that you need at, at 40, let alone, you know, 78. Um, and airbrush, I mean, he could do it all. Do you find the skills that you learned uh, when you were young are transferable between your hobbies? Oh, yes. Yeah. And I, I would say the, I would say the greatest, the greatest resource out there now is the internet. I've learned more from reading other modelers' tips and tricks and, and, and reading some of these model forums. I've, I've learned more in 10 years than I did in the previous 40. Because back then, I didn't know what I was doing. And if I messed up a model, I, there was nobody that I could go to and talk to and say, well, how do I make it better or what did I do wrong? Today, you know, you got a question, you put it out on the internet and you get 50 people to answer you and, and you'll get uh, 20 good answers. And so today, uh, I mean, there's just nothing you can't do that somebody can help you with. And if you have a, a question, get on a forum, whether it's uh, end scale or railroading or boating or whatever you're modeling you're into, there's a forum for that and join it and uh, you'll just get tremendous information. And that yes. will improve your skills so much quicker 
than trial and error. The, uh, the boat building hobby, you have a uh, new modeler, young people coming into that hobby, or is it basically uh, older people like model railroading? Well, I, that's a hard question to answer. I, I, I joined the uh, NAMBA, which is a National Association of Model Boaters, and they're, they're racers. These guys are not, uh, they don't build the, you know, the Cuddy Sark and the, and the Pinta, Nina, and Santa Maria. They build uh, nitro-powered uh, racing boats. So the guys that are doing that are young. These are guys in their 20s and 30s. Mm. And, and these guys are building the fiberglass, go fast, gas engine, and electric boats. And they're racing, just like in cars uh, or trucks. Now, the guys that are doing, I think, this, the fine scale modeling where you're building a, a, a World War II destroyer or a New York City tugboat or something you know, classic or period, those I think are going to be more the older guys, you know, building something you saw or liked as a kid, and now they've got a kit, and and you're going to try it. But most of the young guys are looking for speed and power and go fast. Where do you uh, what? Where do you put your boats in the water? Well, I live like I said in Carmel Valley, which I, I'm I'm really close to Carmel, which is right on the ocean, and. Right next to Carmel is a little town called Seaside, which is right on the ocean. And um, there's a pond right in front of Highway 1, which runs along the highway, the coast. Um, and there's a big lake, a man-made lake there, which has a boat launch. But right now, it's, it's, uh, it's occupied by the homeless um, with their makeshift RVs, because the city doesn't want them you know, on the main streets. So they moved them to the pond. So I haven't been able to uh, to uh, run any boats for the last three or four months. Mm. But we have a lot of golf courses in in uh, in Monterey and Carmel, as you might imagine, with Pebble Beach, etc. We've got eighteen golf courses, and I can't tell you how many ponds there are on these beautiful golf courses. So mm -hmm. once in a while, I'll sneak on one and run a boat in the morning or late afternoon. Uh, you know, to get a little runtime in. Mm -hmm. Chuck, a question that I ask uh, modelers uh, that I'm really impressed with is, how do you know when the model is finished? How do you know it's time to uh, uh, put it aside and start a new project? Wow, that that's that's a really good question. Well, with railroading. I was really never finished because with a railroad layout, you're constantly adding stuff. Now with a specific model, um, I do get to an end point. Um, I really like to detail and accessorize. So for instance, with a boat, once I've got the boat built, then I've got to find the people. Then I've got to find the accessories. Uh, I built a, a lobster boat the other day, or I built a lobster boat a year and a half ago. And just a month ago, I, I found somebody that was building uh, 3D printed lobster traps for it, <laughs> you know, and 3D lobsters. So, you know, I, I put the boat in my cabinet a year and a half ago, and here I am still, um, you know, adding to it in detail parts. So I guess the long answer is uh, with 3D printing and with all the technology out there, uh, sometimes you can really never be finished. I, I built one of these um, Vietnam boats that I showed you, and it's got a tub machine gun uh, mounted in the front. And I bought this boat, I mean, I, I built this boat about five years ago, and I, I decided the other day to look up uh, if I could find uh, some brass spent cartridges to litter <laughs> around the front of the tub to make it look more realistic. And sure enough, uh, there was a company in Germany that not only had the, the, the 50 caliber cartridges, but had the spent cartridges without the bullet in it. So I <laughs> bought a bunch of those and spread them out and glued them down to the, to the, uh, to the boat. So I think maybe that answers your question. It possibly never finished. Bill, that, that sounds uh, familiar, doesn't it? 
Phil? Yeah. Yeah. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? So I actually just had sent a Jim an email saying, you know, as long as you can see a model, it's not done. You can always send me <laughs> a And what you just said is, as long as you can see it, there's always detail to be added, which is an right. interesting perspective. But it's not finished until the detail level replicate, replicates, replicates reality. Right? Yeah. In other words, in other words, what happens is you see something, what happens is you're out, you've seen the model, you looked at it, it's in, in memory, and you're out and you see a part, you say, God, that could work. And you buy it and now you're back working on the model again. The only way exactly. you stop working is it, it's long enough, it's out of your memory. So when you see things that could apply, you forgot it enough where they don't apply anymore. That was kind of the argument I made to Jim is, as long as you see it, it's never done. Because you can always think about something to do. And you say, you know, it'd look better if I had an addition on it. Or it'd look better with, you know, whatever it may be, like you said. Great point. Right. And sometimes the smallest things, I mean, I might find a hat for uh, a crew member that I like better than the one that's on them now, you know? So, and, and those things will come out when you're just, I mean, I was walking with my wife in a, uh, in a souvenir store at some beachside resort. And I, I found a couple of pieces that I could use on my boat that, you know, I never thought I would uh, come across. So like you say, you, you just, as long as you can see it, you can add something to it. <laughs> What kind of adhesive do you have to use with the boat building? I repeat that. What kind of adhesive or glues do you oh. have to use? Well, uh, I use a lot of CA glue, you know, the, the five second glue. And I use the, um, I like the medium uh, uh, viscosity as opposed to the thin, because that kind of tends to run all over. I use a lot of toothpicks and, um, needles um, uh, to help apply it in, in specific spots. But then I use, <clears throat> I use E6000. It's a rubber type glue, comes in clear or black, and it's got tremendous holding power, but it, you can also remove it without destroying what's underneath it. So, you know, like if I wanna secure a, uh, um, a character or a figure to a boat, I might use that. Um, but mostly CA glue, um, because the stuff that I build, especially for RC, um, has to hold. Whereas if I were building a static model, I'd be using just regular, probably plastic cement, because it goes on a shelf and, you know, you're not going to be moving it around a lot. So you mentioned that on the boats, you mentioned that the parts of them are made of fiberglass. Like, do you get uh -huh. the hulls? Do you get the hulls pre-made, or are you making them yourself? No, the hulls I usually buy. Um, about half of the boats, uh, the 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 boats that I've built, came with fiberglass hulls, and the other half are um, are wooden hulls where you have to, you know, put plank on on frame, and you have to steam the wood, you have to bend the wood, and that's really really laborious time consuming a pain in the you know what but <laughs> it's immensely satisfying um for me I, I like the feel of wood i like i like touching it i like rubbing it i like finding the high spots and sanding them down i like uh, you know just i just like working with wood so this last um this last boat that i uh, built i built a monterey clipper uh, because obviously I live in Monterey and there was a, a derelict model out in front of Fisherman's Wharf and I said oh that would be a, uh, an interesting boat to build so I found a couple of, I found three pictures on the internet of one that I liked and I found a guy in Croatia that had a 3D printer I mean a, 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 a laser print a laser cutter and I sent him the pictures and he um cut the frames the bulkheads and the keel out of uh, uh furniture uh quality birch and sent them to me from croatia and then i built the rest 
What wood do you use? I use uh, birch or I use basswood, mostly basswood. And there's a, there's a company called uh, National Balsa out of the East Coast somewhere. They've got a catalog online. And you can order just about any size of, of balsa, uh, ash, um, basswood, you know, all kinds of different wood. So if you like working in wood, with wood, and you want to build structures for your railroad or whatever, National Balsa is a good company to uh, check out. Have you compared them to the wood scale manufacturers that are typically, you know, Kapler and Northeastern and yeah, folks you and normally got, see? Yeah, I've got their wood too. The reason I said uh, National Balsa was the boat that I recently built was 42 inches, and most of the strips of uh, basswood that I uh, uh, that these Kapler and Mount whatever produce were 24 inches, and I didn't want to have to double up the wood. So uh -huh. National Balsa came in 36 inch lengths. So um, cool. I, I bought from them because they had the longer strip wood. But Kapler is a really good company too. I've got, you know. Just another source to add on. I mean, I, I find when you, because I do O scale, and uh -huh. you buy a lot of wood that's like, you know, six by 12s and those kind of things right. you can buy just easy at Hobby Depot. They sell basswood at Hobby Depot and it's not unreasonable. By the time you mar it up and stain it, I don't think anybody could tell the difference, so. Right, yeah. I agree 100%. It's only because I build in the bigger scales that I yeah. needed I, some of the, I, the thing uh, I'm know, bigger wood. This place that I went to here, this place called Ages of Sale that's here, so the blocks that I was looking at, you can buy two of those, and I think they're cast in metal, and they're like three or four bucks from the, the model railroad side online. The age of sale sells a plastic bag of 50 for eight bucks. Wow. <laughs> so, Good price. you know, I'm really, you know, kind of looking at this saying, you know, if you're going to build a bunch of models over a period of time, the concept of having blocks and tackles, they apply in lots of places, you know, for a bar coming out over a door or, you know, whatever. So you can use, and it use two each time. And if you want to make it more sophisticated, you may use more than two. So, you know, you start thinking about it, and you think, well, maybe there are four or five places I could do that. And if I had them kind of there, so I kind of think you get a lifetime supply for eight bucks. So this is kind of that it's that cross hobby. I think Jim, Jim really almost keyed me into this thinking this way about realizing, you know, if you look at all the other hobbies, there are things there that you can bring back. Oh right? yeah. And, and so this was kind of that realization. I thought it was, that was pretty cool. So yeah, I want to go over there. Like I said, the guys, the guys that are the model boat boats, say, I have to go over there and see their shop in Hayward. So, so it's just apparently laced with boat stuff. So, well, you know, I've always wanted to, to, uh, to buy one of those evergreen plastic display uh, 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 cases that they use in hobby stores where they have all the different sizes of plastic strip and sheets. I wanted to buy one of their uh, displays because I use a lot of that, you know, uh, but you know, the outlay was quite a bit, quite expensive. I had an opportunity one time, they were closing a hardware store in uh, Rochester, New Hampshire. And I bought the K and S steel display case with all the ah, stuff. Ah, beautiful! The guy sold me the whole thing for ninety nine dollars. Yes. Okay. Uh, with all the stuff I had bought at home, so I have it mounted on my wall now. It's one of the larger ones they used to make. That has all of the aluminum, copper. Yeah. Hey, hey, all over it. So. Dylan, Dylan, let me share. Turn the share on. I promise to only get, prepare, show good porn. <laughs> 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 it's sure <turned> Dodd. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, let me open a picture here. So you should see this. This was actually um, something that I, I actually, I think I showed this one I, earlier. I don't think I showed it last week when I talked, but um, this is. Oh, yeah. So, oh, nice. So, so this seriously is an hour and a half's work, and it was free. Oh, beautiful. So all this is, is basically these pieces inside here. You guys can see my mouse pointer, these pieces in Yeah. These are thin masonite. They're that thinner masonite, not the thicker, but the thinner. It's like an eighth of an inch. 
and you cut them all to exactly the same size. And then what you do is you run them through the saw and you cut all of them in halfway the same way. And then when you put them against each other, they just all slide into each other. And I kind of changed the size a little because I wanted some bigger ones in the middle for some of the sizes that I use more of. But because you actually, you know, if you think about the sizes, so like this is one by one right here. This is one by two. Well, you don't need this one by two because you have a one by two. So you only fill up half of it plus the center line. So what I'm able to do is use this. And I've actually got it filled up now with all my metal. I've got all my rail and stuff in it. Um, that's just another picture. This is kind of a picture looking down into it. And this outside box, this is just another, this is just some quarter inch plywood. This was some three quarter inch plywood I had sitting around and the base, I just cut the base as a piece of three quarter inch and that's, these are just stapled in and glued and stapled and glued. Like I said, once I got the table saw set up, kind of figured out how to do it, the whole thing took an hour, hour and a half to do with one of, one of my uh, model railroad friends came over and did it with me. And so, yeah, it's, it's great. And this whole thing is about a one foot cube. So it doesn't take up any room at all. And you can put Very it organized. Yeah, exactly. It makes it really easy to find stuff. So Beautiful. If, if anybody's interested, I can, send, I can send some pictures over or something if there's if, if Jim's that Jim wants me to. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, no, I it's because I saw they have so um Mount Albert, which is now owned by the Fast Tracks guys, which is another um they have a thing called the lumber yard. And it's actually a laser cut thing that's got a thing that spins around. It's got some tubes, but it's much more open. There's a lot less density. This thing is just completely dense. Yeah. So. Nice. That'd be an easy project. It's a yeah. very, it, it, like I said, it's literally an hour and a half. Project. The biggest thing is you just, you've got to take, you got to think about the wood, right? So if you want, if you want to have something that's 12 inches, Right. If it's 12 inches on the inside and you want eight compartments, then you've got to make the curves at the inch and a half. Right. And so right. what you do is just line them up and every inch and a half. And so what you do is what you do is you set your table saw up and you just saw into it. And what I do is I kind of just push them. If you think about it, the way the blade goes in the table saw, it's coming around like this. You want to cut four or five at once. You kind of push them at an angle so they match the blade. And then this is a tip, Dick Stark, the guy I mentioned was a shop teacher. What he told me is get a pin, a felt pin, and when you push into as far as you want to cut, where you've cut just past the half through, halfway through, so the lineup, put a little mark on the rip guide so you know you've pushed far enough. And nice. once you set it up, you set up, go zoom on one side, turn it over, zoom on the other side, set the next one, zoom, zoom, turn it over, zoom, zoom. You put those marks and then they just all line up together and then just build the box to drop them into. I, I mean, from a woodworking project, if you built basic, pretty basic woodworking, it's not hard to do at all. Yeah. Well, are you, are you the, the type that, I mean, for me, when I buy wood, I have to buy twice as much as I know I'm going to use because I'm going to break, screw up or whatever. So I end up always buying more than I think I need and I always end up using it. Yeah, so so and actually I did make some mistakes, but I luckily saved it. I actually cut one time the wrong way and I but I saved it in it. But you're absolutely right. This was actually just scraps. So I had some three quarter I had the three quarter inch, I had a chunk of three quarter inch laying around. Um the quarter inch is actually what we use for fascias for modules. So it's actually really nice. Mm -hmm. Um it's a really nice um finish or uh, from Finland, that you know, European. And I just had a couple of pieces laying around and just used them. And, uh, and the masonite I'd actually used for some a masonite project to make some panels up. Uh, if you remember last week, the cities, uh, the city I made up with those, those were actually scrap pieces of masonite that were left over from that. So uh, in this case, it was, it was the fact that I'd bought twice as much in the past and I'd only used 75%. So I'd only <laughs> use that. And I had 25% left as the overage. So this was the overage of the overage. It, you know, wow. it's actually really, so it's actually really interesting The you know, here, I, I, I'll share another picture if you guys are cool with it. Um, so, so the reason I had all of the, uh, I'm going to, I'll, I'll turn my, uh, my share on again. 
So when I started getting back into model row running, I actually built this to go in the garage. Hmm. And oh, that's this nice. is this is actually on rollers. I found this three quarter inch plywood at Costco. It was, I don't know, it wasn't that expensive. I think it was 20 something a sheet. And so this is two feet deep. It's got a plywood back. Um, this is actually designed, this is where all my um, spray equipment goes. So these are all my, you know, these now are all full of all my dirt and, and modeling. And then I built a uh, spray booth to sit on top of it. And wow. I like that. So yeah, it's, this is actually, these are actually pretty easy to build. You just have to find there's a, uh, that, that wasn't the right picture. That's the shepherd. Uh, there's a, you have to get the fan to go on the back of it. I've, I actually have enough pictures. I was actually going to do a construction article on building a, a fan. So what happened when I did that, I ended up with some of that three quarter inch wood left over. And so that's what I ended up using. So nice. <laughs> but yeah, it, I guess I should probably draw up or what I did. Cause I think a lot of people probably like to do that. Cause you end up with, you end up, it, it turns out if you're willing to spend a hundred, $150, you can put in a pretty good bulk order to one of the wood companies. And for most of model railroading, you could just get the 16 inch pieces. And that's right. a, that thing's 10 inches high or 10, I think it was 10 inches high. So basically the 16 inches stick out about six inches. And work really well and you 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 buy them they cost 15 cents per stick that kind of thing they're pretty cheap when you buy them in bulk yeah on, you can go buy it you know and it's kind of a a lifetime supply of wood i mean what i hate is when you're doing something you got to go buy wood I mean, if you think about it that round trip to the store to the hobby shop that's 20 miles around 20 miles each way 40 mile round trip it's basically the cost of an awful lot of wood just in getting there and getting back. Right. So having it in bulk is good. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop to stop talking, Jim. Let's get back to other people. <laughs> Chuck, this company you mentioned, this uh, National Balsa, do they have a minimum order or? No, not that I know how are they, how are they, how are they price wise? Well, I don't want to say they were cheap. I mean, but again, I was buying, I was buying uh, strips that were, I think, out of the ordinary, three feet long, where right. most people are buying the 12 or the 24 inch. So I think I spent about, I spent about $90 on the wood, but I ended up only using about $35, $40 in the long run for the planking of my boat. I, I bought different strips because I wasn't sure I was going to use the same pieces all you know all along so i bought uh the thicknesses were all the same but the widths were different you know eighth inch quarter three eighths and i bought you know uh, ample amount and i just estimated wrong but i think you'd have to probably check it against um the other two companies mount uh the other one that uh, phil mentioned and um northeast oh, northeast, northeast yeah yeah. Uh, the, the thing that I've noticed about pricing is uh, National actually does have better prices and they do have the bigger uh, the bigger uh, sheets. But the problem is, is if you're looking for something like Clabbered or uh, Scribe, uh, they don't carry those. Right. Okay. Yeah, just look at their website real quick. It looks like they it doesn't get really small either, does it? No, I was looking for a specific type, so I wasn't really perusing yeah. everything that they had. You know, when I put in the search for the 36-inch uh, basswood, uh, that's what I put in the search engine is 36-inch strip basswood. So any oh. company that came up with that is what I looked at. I, I didn't look at their full line. So Yeah, no, so I think their smallest um, basswood is 1 16th by 1 16th. Okay. What are, are you guys all into railroading, model, railroad modeling? As far I am, I I'm I don't know about the other people. Uh, from my from my perspective, I'm trying to branch out a little bit knowledge wise, uh, Chuck, and that's why I, to me it was so important for you to be here tonight, because I think it's important for model railroaders not to get just to be 
uh, so wrapped up in only talking to model railroaders. It's, it's like, in, in a lot of cases, I run into people that say, well, I model in HO, so I know you're not interested in talking to me. Well, my mentor was an HO modeler, an excellent modeler, and I model O scale. So to me, the, the modeling skills, the modeling techniques are easily transferable, not just within a hobby, but also between hobbies. Absolutely. So, so, Absolutely. An HO, so an HO scaler can be just as great a mentor for me as an O scaler can. Oh. But, and, if, and, I get, but if I get so wrapped up in my, my hobby that I only am interested in talking to O scalers, or model railroaders, then I miss the opportunity of hearing from people like you and other people in other parts of the hobby business. Uh, and I think I think we're making we're, we're cutting ourselves short because the techniques that you use, the tools that you use, the companies I've never heard of this company uh, National Balsa before. Uh, I un, until Phil mentioned it, for example about you're never finished with a model. No one had ever said that to me before. You are the second person besides <laughs> Phil. Now, it's true, I told Phil the other night this. You're the second person in my life that has ever mentioned that and talked about it from that standpoint, from that perspective. Uh, most people say, well, you know, I, I want to build this locomotive and when I build a locomotive, I, I build it. Well, okay, I'm finished with it. and you know, I, I either put it on the track or I put it on a shelf, wherever I'm going to use it. And that's it. It's out of my mind. It's, it's no longer a part of something I'm building. I have finished that model. And to hear you and, and Phil talk, uh, there's always something else. You never know when it's going to come in. You never know when you're going to see it or what it is. But that, that part of, of the model making is really never finished. And I'd never heard that perspective before you and, and Phil uh, talked about it. So well, I think, that, it's, I, I think it's really astute of you to look outwards for other modelers that maybe aren't even into model railroading, that are still modelers, and the techniques that they use, for instance, airbrushing. You, you can be, I mean, how many different hobbies use an airbrush? You could have somebody making uh, household dishes and airbrushing, or you can have somebody, uh, you know, uh, doing something else with an airbrush that you or I, as a modeler, can learn from. Well, see, I, I look at your boats, for example, uh, and some of, I guess they're decals. I don't know whether you painted them. I have no idea. But, you know, if they're decals, they're beautifully done. I mean, it's beautiful workmanship. But how do you... Are they details or how did you make the? Yeah, well, on one of the boats that I, that I showed you that has a shark's mouth on the bow, that was a vinyl wrap. And it's funny because that boat in our earlier discussion was quote done. It was just a white hull. And I was on the internet and I was looking at um, a, a, a boat site for full, full size, uh, you know, Florida type center console fishing boats. And I saw this fishing boat that had the shark's uh, mouth, you know, like on the World War II airplanes, had a shark's mouth in the, on the bow. And it was a center console boat, like the one I had built. And this was six months after I finished it. So I, I said, gee, that would look good on my boat. So I just clicked a picture of it, put it in my, um, in my file, and sent it to a graphics person that makes graphics for modelers called Cali, C-A-L-L-E, graphics. And she does, she does decals for every modeling uh, genre you can think of, railroads, boats, cars, planes, anything. She, she's a master and her prices are incredibly low. So I sent her this picture of the shark's mouth on this full size center console fishing boat that I saw on the, online. And I said, can you make this? And she said, well, yeah, just give me the dimensions. So I took a piece of paper and put it on the side of the boat and, and, and gave her the dimensions. And four weeks later, I had, the, uh, I had the wrap and I just laid it out on there, you know, and squeegeed it on. And I mean, people think it's a professional airbrush paint job. So 
like you say, there are so many people that you can talk to uh, that aren't maybe in railroading, but have modeling skills in airbrush or electronics. I mean, I'm terrible with electronics. I mean, all I know is positive and negative and that's it. And there's so much wiring that has to do on these RC boats that I build that I always are, I'm going to uh, experts and talking to them and asking them questions um, and picking their brain that aren't necessarily in the boats. They're just good in electronics. I, I have no idea what the material is you're talking about. Uh, yeah, Chuck, is, could, could you explain this wrap? Yeah, I'll, I'll show you a picture of it. Um, let's see here. Can you see that? Yeah. Is, is it like a decal or does it, when you say wrap, that kind of. Well, it's, you know how they wrap cars? Right. You know, if you got if you got a white car and you and you're a locksmith and you want to have your business uh, portrayed on the side, right? You used to have to have it take it to a sign maker and he would he would airbrush it or paint it by hand on there. Right. Well, now they have these these uh, wraps, which they 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 produce the 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 vinyl graphics on a computer, and they print it out, and so, that's what this is. So how how thick would that be, say, in comparison to a decal? uh it, it, it's it's the thickness of uh oh i don't know a decal so it's, it's not very thick at all then oh no it's it's um you know like uh like a piece of saran wrap okay how do you how do you apply it well it, it as it whereas a water soluble decal where you take the paper off the back of the decal this is just the opposite it's it's got a, a front piece. It's got like a, a, a tr like a opaque or semi transparent piece on the front of the decal, and then it's got the uh, adhesive on the back of the decal. So on the wrap, in this case, you center where you want it to go, and you peel the back off of it, and it sticks to whatever surface you you want. Well, how do you get? It? How do you? Uh, uh... So you've got the opaque still on the front, right? Right. And then you just, and then once, you, once you've set the decal in place on the stickiness of the back that's now stuck to your model, then you just pull off the opaque front. The, the, that's just so you don't, um, you don't uh, get any oil or mar it or anything like that. So what do you seal it with then? It's, it's got an adhesive on, on the back of the decal. No, no, what do you, how do you uh before you put it in the water don't you put some kind of a sealer on it or something no you, you, these these wraps don't require water the same it, stuff they use to wrap buses and things like that exactly you, when when, when, you when you peel the back water. off it's That's already sticky and it's already waterproof too because it's made of plastic oh yeah yeah you don't have to do anything to it once you've once you put it on the model you don't have to seal it you don't have to lock it in it's 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 there would, i mean would it, would it be limited to a flat surface or would it go over uh no you can you can or? well i mean yeah you could put it on a compound curve but you just have to you know you have to kind of work it and the bigger the piece you know once once you lay it down it's pretty much down so what i do is i i spray a little um, water with a couple of drops of dishwashing liquid on the on the surface before I lay it down, and then um, I can move it around a little bit, and then I'll squeegee the 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 um, you know the the soapy water behind it out, and let it sit for 24 hours. Uh, if you don't um, do that and you lay it down, if you don't get it down the first time right, you're not going to get it off. Because it's kind of like a contact cement then. Kind of. But I mean, if, if you guys haven't tried um, Cali graphics and, and you need decals, and I mean, she can do anything, any color, any style. I mean, she's a whiz. Um, uh, just, you know, give her a try. You'll f and she can make whatever. You, I mean, if you want the wet decals where you soak them in the water, uh, I believe she can do that too. But I, I mean, I've had her do them for cars, boats, tanks, you where, know. Where is she out of? You know, I don't even I, know. 
I'm just pulling it's, up the website now. It says she's out of New Mexico. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Cali Graphics. I'll oh, put the website you, link in the chat. And, and yeah. you notice on her website, she has warbirds, bombers, jets, World War I planes, civilian aircraft, detailed graphics, and I guess railroading must be in everything else. Yeah. I mean, she. that's where I've, I initially heard of her from people that, that wanted specific um, decals for their planes. Right. And then I, you know, then, I mean, I had a, uh, that lobster boat that I was telling you guys about, I had seen the back, I wanted to name my boat and I wanted a, a clever name. And because my boat was about 36 inches long, I had the idea of what I wanted to say for the, for the back of the transom, the back of the boat. And I was going to name it uh, Just Claws, C-L-A-W-S, Just Claws, um, which I thought was kind of a turn on the words for a lobster boat. But on each side of, on, on the left side of Just and on the right side of the S for Claws, uh, I had her make um, uh, some lobster claws, you know, so uh, she can do custom work. You know, you, if you tell her what you want, uh, she'll kind of draw it up and send it to you. And if you like it, you tell her to go ahead and she'll do it any color, uh, you know, any font style that you want. Um, and cheap, cheap, cheap. I mean, seven, six, eight, ten. I don't think I've ever spent more than 20 bucks, you know, on decals. Vinyl is cheap. It is. It is. Yeah. But I mean, if you guys are doing ON3, uh, or uh, O-scale buildings, like say you're doing a, a blacksmith shop, you could you could you know have your own name for the blacksmith, and you could have it above the the doors of the blacksmith shop, you know, in in uh, uh, in faded paint or chipped paint. She can do all those effects as well. Wow. The, the commercial backdrops that are uh, put out from Auto Railroads. I, I printed on that same kind of vinyl, uh, Lark, uh, L-A-R-C, that Bill Brown from New York. He sells those already printed up. You buy them, they come on, on adhesive uh, uh, vinyl, just like you're talking about, and you prepare your wall, and then you line that right up and squeegee across, and then you can end up putting, you know, 16 inches wide by uh, 34 feet, and it's all printed with, you know, photo backdrops. Um, the ones we use in the museum, I actually had them printed local, but we did it on uh, a, a paper, and the paper was strong enough to glue on the wall, but the, the commercial backdrops you can buy are on that vinyl. Uh, the ones that you see from uh, Bill Brown uh, is one, uh, I, I think you probably know him, uh, but uh, same kind of vinyl that's already printed with the photo backdrops, and they're pretty big and they're sturdy. Hmm. Interesting. Now you mentioned that uh, it, it, the the front is opaque. How do you align it? Well, um, not all of them are opaque. It, it depends whether you want the stickiness on the front or on the back. So you can tell her, for instance, if you were doing, uh, if you wanted graphics for a barbershop window and you might want to have the decals on the back, on the inside of the window. So she would make the sticky surface on the, on the front as opposed to the back. So you can tell her where you want the adhesive. And um, a lot of times, it, like for instance, if the adhesive is on the back, she'll put a, a, like a transparent piece on the front so you don't smudge it with your fingers when you're moving it around. And then once you've set it, then you just peel off the top piece. So when you're saying opaque, when it's the opaque side is the actual graphic that you want then, correct? Yeah. It, it's pretty self-explanatory right. once, once you see the decal. I hate to call it a decal because they're really not decals as the way I used to remember them in my, you know, monogram and Ravel model kits from the 60s. It's basically a sticker is basically what it is. Yeah, stickers. 
So you don't really have to do anything except you just have to send her a picture, right? A picture, yeah. I mean, she's really she's really talented. You could send her, you know, a hand drawn of what you want, and she can kind of, you know, make it better and send it back to you, and then you can uh, tell her whether you like it or not. And she'll scale it to whatever size you want. Exactly. You can just give her the basic dimensions on all my stuff. I say, okay, I need it. I need it semi curved. I need a you know a 180 degree wrap. Uh, you know where the words are in a semicircle. I want them in black. Uh, I want the bottom letters in yellow. Um, I want them in what style font, and she'll do it. But, but I think the point that you were getting to is that you can send her a picture. You know, if you had yeah. a side view of a car, and you took the picture and you said this car is, you know, because you're an N, you're an O scale, let's say, and it's a 48 foot car. You say it's a 12 inch piece and these are the lettering and let her actually pull the lettering off and create it in an image she's able to do that it also said she, exactly. I, her site said you can provide a ping or a png or other things so you can provide input as well your own files so yeah 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 you know, she, you know like yeah. she she's really good for those little details when you said finishing a model when you finished sometimes yeah. you'll look at a model and you'll see uh, like on one of your locomotives, you might see a, a, a an area where you could put no step or danger or hot, you know. You know, and, the thing would be really fun to try with her would be to see, see if you could send her some pictures of some um, graffiti. Yeah. And have her create graffiti, graffiti prints out of it. That would be interesting. Pick the graffiti you wanted. And... I think Walter's catalog has... Oh, there has there, that in there. People have some some stuff in there, but it's kind of getting your own. Sometimes it's nicer to get you know, get exactly what you want. Yeah. yeah. Reg, there's regional graffiti now, so you have oh, to boy. have your regional. <laughs> right. You know, we're doing prototypical modeling, and that car never left that area, so it has to have <laughs> that regional. You know what? I wonder what else you could do with these vinyls is. Could you have a vinyl sheet basically cut to decal the whole side of a car and basically use the decal sheet as a way to help center everything? Here, you you want to hear something really crazy, what you guys could do in, in, in old scale modeling? Let's say you were, let's say you had a tank car and you wanted some really crazy graphics. Have you guys heard of hydro dipping? I yeah. haven't. Yes, it, it's something yeah, you would do with like, uh, yeah, it's um, basically if you dip it in a solution, there's a film on it and the film sticks to the item and leaves a pattern on it. Well, the exactly. Film is, the film's on the water. On the so water. If you push the item down in because the water does the, the shaping around the item as it pushes the film down, you get the, the pattern right. that the film is on the item. Yeah, that's actually you an know, interesting so I thought. Mean, if you were doing a, a, a World War II uh, German locomotive engine, and you could, and it had a uh, a Marklin body that was made out of plastic. We just take the plastic shell off, and have it hydro dip, and it would conform to every nook and cranny. And people would look at that engine and say, "How did you camel those small steps and get them in that cracks and stuff like that?" And that's what hydro dipping will do. I mean, hydro dipping will conform to every nook and cranny. That it would be impossible to get in with an airbrush. Who does that? Well, there are companies all over the country that do it. You just have to kind of, um, you know, uh, type in the search engine uh, hydro dipping, and then you can kind of look for subcategories. They, they use people. it a lot. They use it a lot, Jim, in custom cars. Yeah, yes. so like you'll have a car part, and they'll dip it in, and they'll put this pattern on the car part. They do a lot of that kind of thing. And right. I mean, it's, stuff. it would be cost prohibitive to do it for, a, you know, one O scale right. locomotive or something like that. But um, I only bring that up to give you guys an idea of, of where you could go or what you could do if you had a really complex uh, uh, paint job or pattern. And instead of spending, you know, $300 to have some custom sign uh, airbrush guy do it, you know, for half that you could hydro dip it. 
and because they, they 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 <laughs> they they build the they build what you want on the internet. They'll use a graphics uh, uh, download, uh, a graphics application, and if you want a camo or whatever kind of uh, dip uh, and whatever kind of pattern you want, they'll build it on the computer first, so, and they'll send it to the hydro dipper. He'll print it out and lay it on the on the water like a horse trough and you simply dip the item in and pull it out and it's done so there's there's a business opportunity right you figure out what the paint scheme was on the oh, on the tank engines at the used in world war one that were just released by bach and his on 30. right You'll create that for a hydro dip and then have a service where people sell, send you the shell from their bachman you hydro dip it to put this this very complex camouflage, if there was one. That's an interesting thought. I mean, you could, because you could actually do certain things with certain patterns. I was, exactly right. The, the problem with trying to do like a car is two things. You probably couldn't do it because of alignment. Uh, you know, trying to align it well enough to actually align lettering in the pattern, I think would probably be challenging. And things like rust would be very randomized. But you, you could do something interesting where you could take a car and you could dip it and do a base coat that included, you know, kind of all of the things you would want to get into a base coat. Yeah, I've seen guys do more contemporary stuff like a, an American flag design. And right. now, let's say you wanted a, to have a box car to commemorate uh, the 200 year uh, uh, anniversary of the United States. And you wanted the, the car in an American flag design. Well, that would be a perfect hydro dip where they would, you know, you dip it in there and all three sides of the car would be uh, hydro dipped, uh, would, would look the way you want it and look like an American flag. You know, might be another thing to look at. Um, engine that comes to mind, uh, that Desert Storm commemorative engine that uh, Union Pacific did years ago. Right. You know, that, right. you know, you look at those funky camo patterns that if you try to paint it, it's going to be a bear because then you're basically trying to mask funky shapes. That would be perfect for it. Yeah. Camos, camos I mean, I've seen, it's incredible to see uh, hunting rifles and tennis rackets and just about any basketballs uh, hydro dipped. And they cut, they, you know, it's, I mean, it sticks to practically anything. I don't know how they do it, but it's beyond me, but it's just another another source for us modelers to use in a way that may not be typical. But I've seen small versions, small versions of this where um, they use it for uh, uh, jewelry making or artists mm -hmm. where they put it on polymer, polymer or resin parts and they'll dip them and make their own solution and they lift it up and it creates this interesting pattern all over it where you really would have a hard time creating that by yourself. They'll get like, right or swirls or things like that that you wouldn't be able to get normally. Exactly. Hmm. I've never even heard of it. Hydro dipping. Jim, it's one of the interesting things is uh, you were talking about seeing things from other hobbies. Um, if you, you know, I've, I've learned a lot from looking at what people do with um, um, resins and uh, polymer clay. And I've actually made some buildings completely out of polymer clay and some figures where that's where I discovered like Milliput from England. But, you know, if you look around, not even like you were talking about different models, but actually looking at um, uh, completely different hobbies. And it's really interesting what you see. You find new tools and all kinds of things. Yep. I agree. So I, I, I just agree. saw this online. This is this is an example. This is an example. And it looks like there they sell patterns. I guess the question is, can you print your own patterns, like you can with decals? Because I, you know, we've done that with decals. You can buy decal paper pretty reasonably cheap and print your own patterns. So it'd be really interesting if you could buy that and print your own patterns, then just lay it on a. You know, it looks like what you do is you buy the film, you spray whatever you want a hydro dip with a color with a a coat of glue essentially, and then you dip it down, you lay the plastic out on the water and then dip it down into it and it wraps around it. I mean, if you look at that site, it actually walks you through how to do it. It's, this, this was a do it at home. This is literally a my dip it at home kit. 
It's it's wow. basically. It, it, and by the way, I haven't seen this before. This is what I saw when I I put in hydro dip and. But basically, you've got a scuff pad and clean the thing, clean the part. I don't know. It'd be interesting to try this on something and see if you could do it. Yeah, it would. It I mean, would. There's just there were a whole bunch of these online when you when you looked into the hydro dipping. Um, actually, what I did with ours, I jumped out of it. But these were I was looking at images and then I started seeing these things were were you know do it at home and I and what it is that the the question is can you buy the film that you can print on and then you put on the water and then how do you put it on the water? So that's an interesting thought. I didn't think about doing it at home, but you can actually do it in a, in a different location. If you can Incredible figure out the stuff. film side, if you can fil figure out the film, then what's yeah. to stop you from making just about anything? Chuck, yeah, exactly. let me ask, Chuck, have you actually used this process? I have, I have. What company, I used to, what, what, what company did you go to? Well, I'd have to look it up. Uh, I don't remember the name well, right just, now, Jim. Do me a favor. Send me the email, if you don't mind. Let me know uh, the company. Because, yeah. I, you know, this is something I wouldn't mind calling them and see if they want to be on one of our Zoom shows. Because I, I think Bill brings up a good point. And uh, I don't know anything about these, this uh, capability. But, my gosh, I, I can... You know, if, if this would work, if, if, you know, forget dipping the whole car. What about just bi dipping one side of the car at a time? Exactly. You can, you know, it's, it, it's really a, a fascinating new technology that's used all the time, but most people don't know anything about it. What about old signs for, for buildings? Why not just, can, would that, could you? Can you, in effect, weather the stuff? I guess you can. It's all done digitally, right? Exactly. If you, if so you, you can could, put it on you, film. You could, cre you could create uh, any sign, like Phil did last time, that, that he gets off of his uh, PowerPoint program. Uh, I guess you could do it that way, couldn't you, Phil? I mean, you know, to be able to create the, si the whole side of a building. I think like there's, two, there's two different things. I think the problem with the hydro dipping is it's a pattern thing more than anything else. And you put the pattern onto whatever you dip into it. And, but the, I think it's really hard to do any alignment. So you have to think about, that's why the camouflage works. It's a random pattern. Like if you went on there, there was a wood grain pattern. So if you wanted to have a wood grain on something, you could kind of look down because you, you think about it. You've got the pattern laying. I, I mean, it, what you're really doing is you're taking a decal and you're putting it basically outside down laying in water. And then you're using what, what's that, what's that thing when you, when you push something down into water, it displaces it. It's called, it's, it's one of the Greek guys. I, it's somebody's principle. The buoyancy here, principle, I think. Or no, it's not buoyancy. It's Archimedes principle, I think. Archimedes principle. It's Ar good job. Archimedes principle. So, <laughs> I knew this braid was worth like, something. Like if, you, if, you, if, you, if you ever do souvé, if you, you want to do a, a piece of, of meat in a plastic bag and seal it, you put it in the bag and you push it down into water, and the water pushes the air out of the bag because it's heavier than the bag. So if you think about it, you've got this laying on the water. When you push the part down into it, it touches. And as you push it down in, it displaces the water. And as the water displaces, it pulls that stuff in and wraps it around it. And that's what happens. I, the place I saw this and I know about it was that, um, what's that, that British car show where they rebuild cars and there's the guy who buys the cars and there's the- Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that show, they did wheels for a car this way. I watched them do it. They took the wheels for the car and they showed this big tank. I mean, it's a big tank. It was like six by six or four by six, you know, that kind of size. And they had wheeler dealers. Rocket. Wheeler dealers. And they laid. You saw the material laying in the tank, and it was like a, it was like a, you know, a tiger pattern or something like that. And they took the wheel and they lowered it down, and you saw that stuff just wrap up around the wheel. Is it? I exactly? saw that episode. And, and that's so that if you see that, that's what happens. That's why I think it's hard to align it. So it has to be random patterns, but it's a really interesting thought about random patterns, putting random patterns, wrapping something. Yeah. Anyway, interesting thought. Yeah, it is. 
Some of the modelers could definitely use. I mean, think about it. If you, it's not just us that could potentially use that. You know, I go I, I go go into the tanks real quick. You know, perfect. You know, you look at a tank, like say German Army. They would give you a palette of colors for the certain season. That would all be, and you would slather them on, and whatever pattern you felt like. But you would use two of them, and then one of them would be the base coat, and the third would be the base coat. So. There's no wrong way of putting camouflage on something. So why not? I, I think it's brilliant. I mean, it's something that somebody re that frankly needs to be thought about. Just I never because, even thought about it. Just because of the potential of it. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely, it definitely wouldn't work for lettering, though. You, know, you were talking about you wouldn't use it for the car side lettering that raises me a question when you were talking about the, the vinyl chuck uh if you were trying to use it on uh, the side of a model railroad or a side of a boat that was riveted the vinyl probably wouldn't settle in all around your rivets or your ribs or something would it probably not that that you would you would use your more traditional decals with solve a set and you know decal setting uh solutions to really sit well this is going to be for more of a uh, flat smooth surface yeah very smooth surface is best best suited for it right so like a steel like a tank car would be another good application yeah. there side yeah. of a locomotive cab where you've right. got a set flat space for numbers that, that mm. could, it, it's another good it, i hadn't thought of using vinyl in this App in this way before either. That's I, I got to admit that's got me thinking. Because if you can, if you take the side of a locomotive cab or the side of a tender or whatever that flat surface, and you want to put the lettering on it, what's going to look better if you've got say a matte paint job, uh, a decal that you could see the see the film left because it's already matte and it just doesn't you know something you got and you're like, you know, I want to put lettering on it. What's going to be the better option? Yeah. Putting something that's going to leave the film and you can't really, you know, unless you cut everything out perfectly that you're going to have that film left there. Well, or, that's the nice thing about the Cali graphics is when, when they give you a decal and you, uh, uh, you, there's no, there's no film on the sides of the letters. Right. The that's picture. what I'm thinking. So let's say, you know, I don't know, you got a weathered model and you want to, or, or something that say, let's say you combine that with the, the idea of the hydro wrap and you want to put your lettering on it. Well, the lettering is going to look perfect and it's going to, it's not like it's going to ruin the look of the wrap either at that point. Correct. You just, have to, you just have to be careful though, because what you mentioned about the side of a tender, most tenders have some kind of rivets or ribs or something. This is better. This is very well suited to a uh, fiberglass uh, boat hull and stuff like that. But yeah. if you've got rough surface, I get a feeling you're going to get a lot of, of awful uh, little little air pockets and stuff like that around the vinyl. You'd, might, you'd probably might, need to scribe it down or, or use some sort of stylus to force it down. But it might be an interesting way to sort of uh, do like raised lettering or plaque lettering that was put on. Um, I'm thinking of, of locomotive numbers and that type of thing. And in Canada here, we often used a, a crest that was uh, like metal, printed metal in various uh, railway applications. And it might actually simulate that. That's another so good idea. If what they're doing is they're combining printing with cutting the vinyl in the same jig, that's what becomes really interesting because you can actually cut a lot of things as single things that normally on decals because the way decal the way decals work you have to have a lot more backing to work with them i mean you could take those heralds and things that sometimes are you know tend to be alone and make them up as an image um you know that by the way is anybody else use dry transfers very much i, I do have I have. I have. so there there's a place there was a place if you haven't done them there's a place up called all out graphics in vancouver in Canada, and they're really pretty good. They're not inexpensive, but they're pretty good. I think they were to get you know they were about 
30 bucks to get a sheet, a 17 by 11 sheet uh, made into a graphic and then about 30 bucks to do a print. And, and that's an awful lot of graphics. If you're doing a private railroad, two sheets, so a hundred bucks is a li almost a lifetime supply of graphics. So. And they're, they're currently in business? Yeah, I, they were there last time. I mean, it was interesting when I talked to them, they actually helped me because I was having problems getting adhesion with the dry transfers and they talked to me about heating the model first. And so you actually take your heat gun and you just warm it so it's warm, not hot. And then they stick a lot better. But in that process where we're going through it, and we, we had a little frustration because my first time ever using, you know, the, the graphic, big graphics packages. Um, there was a point at which he told me that they make the dry transfers they put on the inside of the Steinway pianos. So right. when you sit down at a Steinway piano and they open the thing up and the letters are there that say Steinway, those are actually their dry transfers. Wow. Hmm. Which I thought was kind of interesting. So it's actually a good place to get them, but it's not dirt cheap. It's much better if you're planning. So I was doing a ON30 private railroad and I made up a big sheet with kind of all the numbers I would ever need, all the lettering I would ever need. You know, figured out what do I want to put on every tender? What do I want to put here? What do I want to put here? And made all of those up on a sheet and then did two of them. Do they do the graphics for you at all? Or do you have to supply all the graphics done? In this case, I did the graphics, and then they created the master for the, the thing. But I did it in, um, in what it, no, what's the, the graphics bag? The one, I can't even remember the name of it now, the one everybody uses. Um, yeah. Woodland Phoenix? Illust like Illustrator, in Illustrator. You know, in the in the graphic computer graphics package that all the computer artists use, it's called Illustrator, and you actually you you generate these in Illustrator. The, the problem is the images you have to generate are like 20, 30 meg images, single image, because they're incredibly you know they're huge. They do a huge pixel density, and that's what they have to feed into their thing. So you kind of and I got a free what I did was I got a free contract and I used it. And then I moved all of my, um, I, I actually had started doing it in PowerPoint and it wasn't possible to get the graphics revolution. So I'd done some, I'd done some images, the, the logo images there, and they were high enough resolution as bitmaps. And I brought them over and put them on the big image. So it, it takes a little work, but, it's, but when you get done, they, they're very high quality. Cool. Well, gentlemen, I'm gonna have to, beg off here so i'm going to say goodbye um but i'm looking forward to the next one chuck i want to thank you so much for coming tonight it's really been a My pleasure, pleasure meeting you and and i really do i uh, thank you so very much for your time and your and all your comments well it's a pleasure meeting all you guys too thank you very much great thank you very much thanks all right. chuck bye-bye now Bye. Right. well guys uh Anybody have anything else they want to talk about? Otherwise, I'll tell you about our next one. I got something uh, since it's similar. Uh, a couple of years ago when I was down in Florida, I was attending a live steam meet down there with my brother-in-law and sister. And it turns out they had a uh, tent set up with dealers. Well, I came down, I didn't know there was anything for sale down there, so I didn't bring any money. Got looking around and here's this steamboat. I said, oh man, that's neat. I said, well, if it's still here at the end of the day, maybe I can get money from uh, my family and uh, buy it. Well, the end of the day went back to the tent and of course it was gone. So I figured, well, it must have been sold. Well, the next year went back to the meet and this is down in Dundee, not far from um, the old uh, Cypress Gardens, which is now Legoland. Went back down. This time I had money with me. And my sister said, well, go check out your tents. So I went out, looked, the steamboat was there. Found the person bought it. So I was real happy because it's about 148th scale. It looks great for the layout. I'll try and show it here. See if uh, can be seen. 
We can see part of it. Yeah, yeah. okay. It's that big. <laughs> yeah, well, it's pretty good. To, oh, there we go. How's that? Yeah, that's, that's perfect. better. The stern end, the paddle wheel is just fantastic on it. Of course, the guy told me it's not uh, live steam, it's a static model. I said, that's okay. So that's the neat. amazing price that I paid for this, $12. <laughs> so, uh, of course, I got the Kentucky River on my layout, so this is a perfect boat for that. I was real happy. I guess I was meant to have the boat after all. <laughs> <laughs> you never know what you'll find and how you can use it. That's for sure. The only challenge is going to be digging the base into the river bed yeah. to put it in place. Yeah, I hate to tear hole. the paddle wheel up just to anchor it. So it's still sitting on the base right. waiting. So that's yeah, coming. It's almost it's like designated. You're... I got a dock and everything for. Her. I had yeah. uh, one of those um, S scale kits uh, for a, a tow boat. Yep. From I think it was uh, Lindbergh years ago. And I said, "Oh, that'd be terrific." Well, I opened up the box and looked, and it leans closer to H O scale than it does S scale or O scale. So it's really too small for um, what I wanted. But I, I, I guess that guy's got a full hull. It's, it's model is a full hull. So what I was thinking is you may want to think about where you want to put it, cutting, putting foam for under the water. So you can cut down into the foam. And what you can do is you can put sculpt mold in there and then wrap the boat with saran wrap and squinch it down into the sculpt mold Oh, yeah. To make a form of it that it's going to sit down into. And then you do all the water around it, put that down in, and then pour your water. And that way, it'll look like it should be the right height in the water. Because yeah. trying to cut it off is probably really hard. And this way, you just let it be buried down into the layout. Yeah, well, I'd much rather keep the whole hull because it'd be a pain to try and cut well, it. That, that's what I'm saying is you can sink yeah. the hull down into the layout if you kind of do it that way. And then just, you know, you, you sink it down in, use the saran wrap to, to sink it down in and push like sculpt the mold around it. So it's got a cavity. And then after that sets, you can pull it out, pull it, pull it out. And then you can finish the water all around it. And then you put the boat back in, glue it back in right before you pour the water. And then it looks right. And you can decide the height of the water line based on how far you push it down in. Mm -hmm. Sounds yeah, good. That, that's always been my problem with, I've, I've seen a couple of these boats that, are the full hull boats. And the problem is how do you put those onto a module or onto a layout is a real challenge. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And then uh, been holding this for the last couple of sessions. I picked that up at a, uh, basically a state sale. Uh, one of our uh, club members from both Florida and Michigan area passed on. So this is a Cincinnati and Lake Erie freight motor, the last uh, ones they had built new back in 1930. Part of the fleet ended up going to California for the Central California traction system, but they were made into uh, trailers. The others, uh, part of them that were going to California got into a derailment and ended up being scrapped right there along the railroad line. And then uh, a few of them ended up in gravel pits. American Aggregate uh, bought them, put diesel motors in them and made them into uh, diesel locomotives that worked the gravel pits. It's kind of a weird, what? So wait a minute, <laughs> you bought an interurban freight motor. Uh-huh. You threw a diesel in it. Right. Put a diesel with the generator in it, and you got your traction motors again. I mean, don't get that's me wrong. A, that's, a, diesel that's, a cheap, is. that's a cheap way of doing it, but, like, how powerful is that really going to be? Well, it worked, uh, what, from the uh, time the line ceased back in the uh, early 40s until just a few years ago, about 20 years ago when they were closing up the gravel pits. 
That's weird. I, I I didn't even know that. I mean, yeah. I heard of a few trolleys that were converted to, you know, have a diesel generator under them only because they didn't have overhead wire. You know, yeah. it was a tourist railroad. I've never heard of a business doing that for the sake of getting a cheap locomotive. Yeah, well, we uh, uh, we worked on trying to get one out of the Oxford uh, gravel pit up here in Michigan. Uh, was from the Indiana Railroad. Was a former uh, parlor car that had been converted into a freight motor by the Interurban, and then it got sold to American Aggregates. And since it was too long, they cut it in half, shortened it, put the diesel into her, and operated <clears throat> at the gravel pit for years. But, so but that some was of really, these so, uh, locomotives and that uh, have strange histories. So they use that then to pull cars through the hoppers, the loader hoppers, and that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So they probably never moved very many cars at a time. No, they tr probably just use them for switching around in the yard until right. they got a train made up for the railroad. So. I, our Indiana Railway Museum got one of them. As it, as it was modified, and they still have it, apparently. That's something else. Yep. Hmm. I never thought I would hear about that. Well, well, I got uh, a stranger one than that. And there's uh, one of these in, oh, there's one of these up in Maine, too. I have to bail. I've got to jump. But oh. I will talk to you guys next time. Have we'll a great be that way. Bye now. Have I'm a good sorry. evening. I, my wife, just, my <laughs> wife just, just peeked around the corner, and we have to get together and go do something. Thanks. Bye okay. Now. Have a good one. Well, well listen, guys, it's, uh, it's getting close to 9 o'clock here. Yep. Uh, what did you think about uh, the modelers uh, from different uh, areas uh, coming in and talking to us like this? Did you enjoy this? Was this helpful? Was this interesting? Well, it was interesting, Jim. I liked it. I think yeah. we need to do it again. Well, we'll see what we can find. Listen, Good. next time, next, next time uh, Saturday, July the 18th, Tim Gilman. Dylan, you want to talk a little bit about your friend, Tim? All right. So Tim is a guy who I met through Dan, as, as um, Dan will tell you. I met him because he was there working on Dan's layout with me one day. Hmm. And um, he's an HO scale modeler um, trying to emulate the work of George Stelios. And frankly, he does a very good job of that. Um, it's one of the best. He's a, a very good detail-oriented modeler. Um, I've done most of the wiring on his layout. Um, you know, and we'll, we'll probably see parts of the layout as well, but um, it's fully lit. It's basically, it's basically the layout is complete. And Tim is just going, where can I put something else? <laughs> the sad part is, is we're probably getting limited by the amount of space that we can splice wires into. Not to say there aren't some spots that we couldn't splice them in, but um, alligator clips do take up space, or um, I'm sorry, suitcase connectors are what we're using. Mm. And they work great, but they do take up space. So we're going to be talking with him Saturday about his HO skill modeling. You know, that's really about the size of it. Fantastic. Hey. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for coming. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something that will help you with your modeling. See you thank Saturday you. evening.